several years ago when Liz and I first moved here, uh, we used to go downtown a lot. Uh, I don't know if you do this when you... <laughs> When you first move here, you kind of want to go down and see everything downtown, you know, Smithsonian and everything. So there's many times that we'd go down for dinner about halfway there, and then after that, go down and park down by the Lincoln Memorial, and then just go walking and seeing things. Uh, and I, when I first heard it was the mall, since I like to shop, I thought, I'll go. <laughs> but it's not that kind of mall, right? They're just kind of strolling along. So we go to the Korean War Memorial. My dad fought in that war. And uh, I know people on the, the Vietnam Wall. So we would go look at names of guys I knew uh, growing up and, and stuff. And said it was very meaningful to go down there. And one night when Liz and I were down there, we're, we're from you know California. So we weren't really used to rain, thunderstorms, things like that. We didn't realize how much it rains here. It, it rains a lot, doesn't it? Like I got up Friday morning on my day off and I washed both my cars. For what reason? You know, I tried to get all the pollen off of them. I was so excited. And then, then last night, phew, so I'm back to square one again. So anyway, that's not part of my sermon. But we were down the mall walking along. It was an evening. It was beautiful. It was kind of, you know, ominous looking clouds, black here and there. But it wasn't raining. So we were just having fun walking and seeing the memorial, memorials. And all of a sudden, I mean, it just poured, just pelting us. Uh, and so, and then, then there was lightning, just jagged, just spider webbing across the sky. And we're like, we, I know, I'm smart enough to know we got to get, some, get to cover quick. So uh, there was only one place to run to, and that was a men's and women's bathroom. And I saw it. And everybody else that was on the mall walking there that day was running and doing the same thing we were doing. We were, no one wanted to be caught in the open, because I had a friend that, you don't want to stand under a tree. Now that we know that, remember what happened here the other day with that huge oak? It's about a, they, about a 150 year old oak was taken out by a lightning strike here the other day. Just split it right down the middle. Just blew all the bark off it. It was unbelievable. So I knew it. I want to stand under a tree. So we're running to the bathroom uh, with everybody else, and everybody's filing in there. You couldn't have got a sardine in there. It was tight. And so Liz and I wound up kind of on the outside under an overhang. We, we thanked God for that, for the protection of the overhang of the bathroom. And you're in there with all these people you don't know. And it's amazing how many people, when something bad happens, they, Americans just pull together, don't they? <laughs> I'm serious. So all, man, all walks of life, all kinds of ethnicities, everybody's in there. And we're just, you know, all in there for one reason. Why are we there? We're not there to go to the bathroom. Why are we there? We'll stay dry and not get electrified, right? No one wants to get hit. So we were there for protection. Safety. That's why we were there. And when the storm eventually blew through, then we ended up, you know, enjoying the rest of the evening. Think about that from a theological perspective. When, not if, a storm hits you like that, where do you run? Where do you go? Uh, I know lots of people, and I've studied people all my life and uh, counseled lots of people. I can tell you places people run, which, where they shouldn't run when something bad happens to them. Uh, they'll run to, like, drinking. And they'll just drink their way through whatever the storm was. Or they'll take some kind of opiate or uh, you name it, fentanyl, or you name it. They'll take some kind of drug to kind of help them make, make it through it. I mean, I've had friends who would, uh, back in the day, drop acid to get through a rough spot and stuff like that. Is that the best thing to do? No, nah, probably not. If you're a Christian and a storm comes your way in life, where should you run? Pretty simple. God. You should run to God. That's Psalm 91. Psalm 91 uh, is theologically very simple. This could be a very short sermon, but it's not going to be. <laughs> miracle of miracles. Uh, he's going to answer one, one question that he's going to develop through this passage in a threefold movement. Uh, he's going to say, how should you as a Christian respond to life's threatening storms? Not, not, not if they happen to come your way, but they're going to come your way. You're going to either be in one, you're either in one now, you just left one, or you see the clouds on the horizon coming your way. It, it, it is the nature of life. And in this passage, uh, God is going to talk about how he is your source of defense and protection. You would run to him in a storm for him to protect you. Not that he is just going to do it without you running to him. You have to have some skin in the game, as it were. So Psalm 91 uh, is, uh, is uh, interesting uh, from uh, what it says outright. God is there to protect you. But then there's tension in the psalm because we all know in life, it seems like there's limitations to what we read here. So this is a, a very interesting psalm when you look at problems in life and what God promises you to you. So the first 13 verses, to look at it structurally, we have to do that first to be able to understand what he's going to say. So structurally, the first 13 verses are what we would call as a wisdom psalm. So a wisdom psalm uh, is something uh, uh, akin to Proverbs. It's a, it's a bunch of statements from God that transcend time in their truth. 
So whatever he says, uh, like Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, a lot of Christians memorize that. Do you know it? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he'll desert you. <laughs> no. He, what will he do then? Well, then he'll direct your path. But so there's tension in that. I, I have to believe God is. I have to trust him. I have to, I have to step forward and do that. And when I do that, he promises to give direction to my life path. What's the antithesis of that? If I don't trust in him and I trust in my own mental acumen and everything, he's not going to be direct in my, my path. So wisdom psalm is a truth that transcends time, but there's exceptions to that truth when you walk through life. Uh, and that's what Psalm 91 is. It's a wisdom psalm in like the first 13 verses. Uh, so exceptions in a wisdom psalm would be these two things. Those timeless truths that God gives you, number one, have exceptions. And I'll illustrate that in just a minute. And then the number two, a wisdom psalm also has an exception of the, the truth of the psalm is dependent upon your activity or translated your obedience. To the, to the truth. So if you don't obey the truth of said wisdom's proverb or song, uh, God will not follow through on what his end of the bargain is because you're not being obedient. And if you're a parent, you understand how this works, right, with children, right? Do you reward them when they're disobedient? Are you thinking about it? Uh, no, no. And so that's God. So think about Job. We're, we're setting up the structure of the passage, right? It's a, the first 13 verses forming the heart of the passage is a is wisdom construction. So think about Job. He lived a long, faithful, blessed, amazing life. From his perspective, God was his protection. God was his source of strength, etc. But in God's dimension, in his heavenly courtroom, uh, the devil, Satan, the accuser, is allowed to go in there and bring accusation against the saint. So he comes there to bring accusation against Job because he has a problem with his, his godliness. And you know what transpires. You know, you just let me have at him and I can get him to curse you. And what's God say? I'll take you up on that. So from God's perspective, he is, he is Job's uh, provision and protection, but he's also gonna allow one caveat. I'm gonna allow you to, the devil to work in his life, and I'm going to I'm going to deepen this saint, and I'm going to protect him along the way. But um, I'm going to remove the protective hedge a little bit, so you can I can show you just what a great man of God he truly is. It's a great book if you haven't read it. Uh, so that's that's a, like a wisdom psalm, as you see in Psalm 91. Another thing is Israel uh, in in Egyptian bondage. The only way the death angel will pass by their house is for them to take the lamb that's prescribed, slay it paint the, door, the blood on the doorpost of the house. When the death angel descends and comes to strike the firstborn of the family of Egypt, if he sees the blood, he passes by. If he, if he doesn't see the blood, he strikes the firstborn. So if you had to be obedient, you had to believe that the application of the blood of the sacrificial lamb put on your doorpost protected you. If you said, I don't believe that, that's ridiculous. Well, you need to watch the movie. <laughs> you seen that thing? That's one of my favorite movies, Cecil B. DeMille, remember? When that dark cloud forms and that little finger comes down and it's the death angel and it's the smoke through the streets and he's, he's, he's looking for blood. And, th and that's how you get saved. If the blood of Jesus is applied to your life in faith, well, then when the death angel comes, you have life. He passes you by. That's, that's the gospel. And so when you look at uh, Israel, they, in, from a wisdom perspective, God says, I'm going to protect you as my nation, but for you to be protected, well, you have to have some skin in the game. You have to be obedient. And that's what we're going to see here in this passage, that, that God is, he is your source of protection and he is your source of strength, but he will not, he will not keep you from all troubles in life, but he will be with you in them as we see. Uh, and uh, you're responsible to run to him. So with all that in mind, uh, let's look at the three things he says you should do when the storm comes. Remember, it's not, an, not, it, it's a, it, it's not when it's going to happen, it's if it's going to happen, and it's going to come soon. So prepare yourself. What should I do? Number one, be confident when the storm hits you. I mean, when you're out walking with the wife and the storm hits, uh, be confident that if you run to God, he's going to be there for you. So what does he say? Verses one and two. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh, the eternal God, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, uh, in whom I will trust. Notice he he's a, makes a concerted effort to trust in that God. So he who dwells, let's look at that. It's three words in English, it's one word in Hebrew. Yoshev, 
is what it is in Hebrew. So it, since it's an opening statement, it's, an, it's a participle. Uh, does grammar matter? Yes, it matters greatly. Uh, that's why you come to church, to learn Hebrew grammar, isn't it? And so why would there be a participle there? You can't see it in the English text. You can in the Hebrew text. And, uh, and, and you have two options because of the participle. He who dwells in a secret place of the Most High. It's, put your name in there. I can say, uh, when Marty dwells in the secret place of the Most High, then God is my shadow who protects me like a mighty tree. That's what he's saying. So it's, it's a participle. So I have two grammatical options. Number one, it can be the durative use of the participle. What does that mean? That means it continues. So think about it pragmatically. Is it, is it a good lexical grammatical option to assume that a Christian will always abide in the presence of God at all times? Do you? No lying. <laughs> right. Because what is your faith really like? Well, I'm obedient and disobedient. I run to God. I don't run to God. I run to myself. I, no, I run to God. And is, not, is that your life? Yes. Don't you wish it could just be straight and linear to glory? Uh, wait till glory, then you'll be there. But um, so I don't take it as a durative because I know from my own life, I have moments of obedience and running to God. And other times I think I'm smart enough to handle this. Uh, so I take the other grammatical option. It's an iterative use of the participle, iterative. What's that mean? Well, you do this occasionally. Well, that grammatically makes sense, doesn't it? That when, when something happens in my life, storms come in my way, getting pelted, lightning, et cetera, whatever it is, when I, when I run to God, that, that's when he sees me in that secret place and that's when he protects me. But I, I don't always do it. I wish it was durative, but I think it's iterative just to be, you know, look at life. So the question is, where's your secret place? He says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. Where is your secret place? The word in Hebrew for secret place, seter, is the word. Uh, It's used in 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse uh, 2, when Jonathan tells David, his good friend, if you don't want my dad, the king, to find you because he's jealous over you, you're going to be the king, my dad wants to take you out. So if you want to get away from my dad, you better go and find a secret hiding place. Well, that is an interesting word because... uh, I will show you probably what was on David's mind when he thought about that secret hiding place. Uh, This is a picture uh, that I took uh, in a wadi uh, or a ravine uh, in in Gedi in the Dead Sea, not too far from Masada. Uh, Just just walking up the ravine uh, with my uh, tour group, uh, looking at the waterfalls and stuff down in the the ravine. Awesome. Uh, You just spin around and take pictures of caves everywhere. And so the first time you walk up into the, the, up, up the, up the waterfalls in Getty where uh, David hid in the cave as the waterfall fed into the cave and, and, and Saul came in there to go to the bathroom. I always wondered, how did he cut off the bottom of his garment and he didn't know it? It's, the loudness of the waterfall in the cave kept him from hearing what was happening. But anyway, as you're walking in there, you see caves everywhere. So you think of this is a possible, no wonder he came here. If you want protection, there are secret places all over the place. So David's like, I got this. I know where to hide. There's caves all over the Dead Sea and the walls of the, of, the, of the mountains all down there in the wilderness. He says, he who dwells uh, in the secret place of the Most High. So you have to ask yourself, well, are there any caves around your house? Why are you so quiet? Have you found any? No. So if you're a literalist, you're going to be hard for us to find a cave. So God's telling you, you need to find a cave, as it were, where you go and hide. Now, uh, it, difficult to get to one of these locations, correct? So if you actually hid in one of these, be hard for the enemy to find you because, like, where is he? I don't know. You got 500 caves to go search. Really? Are you kidding me? So you can hide in there. It's accessible. It's quiet. It's cool, etc. So you have to think to yourself, where is my secret place? Do I have one? Do you have one? I have them, but I can't tell you because then it wouldn't be secret. <laughs> then the whole church shows up. Yeah, hey, we've got a drone flying over his house right now. He's in the secret place. No, <laughs> I know this place. Uh, so the secret place, what could it be? Uh, I, I like, I have a swing out in my backyard under some trees. I like to hang out there. It's quiet. Uh, do not. Now I'm telling you where it is. Don't show up. Okay. I'm on the other side of the fence. I like to go out there and just kind of chill, talk to God, have a moment. It's just me and him. Uh, I like the chairs on my back patio. Uh, Just chill, talk to God, read my Bible, talk to him there. Uh, There's places inside because there's weather here. So I have special chairs inside the house. I like to chill early in the morning, 5, 5, 30 in the morning, talk to God, me and him. But I've got my secret places that I go to, right? I even have secret places around here where I go. 
where I just, I have to leave my office. I have to, I tell them I'm leaving. I usually tell them where I'm going, but I, I got to get out. Just have a secret place. Why? Because if, if, if a storm's coming your way or you're in the middle of the storm, you, you need that place where you can hear God. And then when you run there, you know that the most high God, he's going to be there to be your mighty tree to protect you. you. You'll bite under the shadow of the almighty. Almighty means he's un unlimited power. Like when he created the cosmos, ex nihilo, out of nothing, he didn't, it doesn't, no, no power's used. He's perfect power. So if he's the almighty with perfect power and you run to him, he looks at your issue and says what? Well, Lord, my culture's about to counsel me. It's the end of my job, my career, I'll never get another job. What does God do? He looks down from heaven and says, <laughs> really, it's not that big of a deal. I, I totally got your career, I got your life, I mean, it's, it's gonna be okay. Uh, that's his promise, he's the almighty. So you need to find a what? A secret place, a secret place. And be confident when you go there, you're gonna meet God. Which, what facet of God am I gonna meet? He said, you're gonna meet the most high God there. El Elyon. Elyon is used here, but El Elyon is the most high God, meaning there's no God greater than him. And there's no God greater than him. So God's name in this passage, like where he talks about in my God in whom I'll trust, this is Elohim, first name of God in the Old Testament, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created all things. What's the name of a well, false God in Hebrew? El Elim. Elohim. El Elim. Sound familiar? What's that tell you? False worship is just a few degrees off center of truth. I mean, easy to deceive you. And he says, no, when you run to God, go to Elohim, not El Elim. And when you go to the true God, you're going to find he's your source of protection. He's your refuge and he is your fortress. You can have confidence. What do you say when you get into the cave? Verse two tells you what to say. What do you say? It's in English. I'll say to the Lord. I'm telling you, this is your, this is your part right here. <laughs> he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I, I choose to trust, right? That's your part. You're obedient. I will put my trust in him, uh, and, and God will be there for me. This, he will be my refuge, my cave, and my fortress. The word for fortress here uh, is the word, you're probably wondering, why do, I ha why do I have a picture of Masada here? Because uh, the word used here for fortress is Masuda in Hebrew, which is the derivative of the word Masada. It, it means mountain fortress. So God, I don't know if you've ever been to Masada, but if, you've, if, you, if you're there, it's mind boggling. I mean, it's like 13, 1400 feet straight up. Uh, this is where Herod built this massive uh, military complex. Uh, if you ever had to leave town and hide, he had food storage lockers here, uh, water in cisterns. I mean, this place was an amazing, amazing fortress. Um, I remember the first time I went there, uh, right after 9-11, tourism was down 75% because people were afraid to fly. That was the perfect time to be vacationing in Israel. No one was there. And I remember when I, um, uh, I walked down uh, Masada on the other side was the snake path, uh, zigzags all the way up to the top. I, I walked down, it was, I don't know, it must have been 105 degrees as I was walking down. And um, I had a video camera and I, I used to be a tree trimmer, so I'm not afraid of heights, but I'm walking down going, if I fall, I mean, no one's even know I fell. There's no one out here. So I just, I took a video of the whole surrounding area of the Dead Sea. And I was talking while I was videotaping, you know, 1200 foot drops. And I told my wife and children something like this. Hi, this is your dad. This is Marty, your husband. And if I don't make it, just know I loved you. <laughs> you know, that, that type of thing. And then I began to walk down Masada. And I, when I got down to the bottom and looked back up, I thought, who in their right mind would try to attack it? Well, the Romans did and built a ramp. But it's like impregnable. So God says, when you come to me in your storm, know that I'm going to be like Masuda, like a mountain fortress, like impregnable, and you're going to find safety in there. doesn't mean you can't be attacked, but be confident that's what he'll be for you. Then he gets into the meat of what he wants to talk about because verses 3 to 13, he's going to talk about be confident, and then he's going to say, well, you should be encouraged too. When you come to me, you should find encouragement. So if you were studying this from a Bible study methods perspective, which is called hermeneutics, the discipline of hermeneutics, Bible study methods. This is the law of proportion. So the most amount of information spent in a passage is where the author's placing his emphasis. So what does he say here? He waxes eloquent in these verses on why you should be encouraged when you run to God. Verse three, surely he, God, shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. That's encouraging. That trap is not. 
Now, I know it's super analytical church, super educated church. I get it. You've already looked at that and thought, that is not a bird trap. <laughs> How many totally saw this? And, and what is Marty thinking? Yes, you know, that is not a bird trap. What kind of trap is that? Yeah, that's a bear trap. So who in their right mind would want to stumble across one of those? Nobody. Uh, and if it was a bird trap, well, you, no bird to eat if it's that trap. But, but just go with it, okay? Can you go with it? Be gracious, merciful, and kind. It's, it's Christian. Because I really couldn't find a bird trap. Uh, so think about it. Who has not gone through? He's not telling you uh, that you're going to go through life and nothing ever is going to happen to you. No, he's telling you he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, meaning you got nailed by said trap. Have you ever taken a job and just thought, man, this looks awesome, this looks amazing, oh, wonderful, and it turned out to be the worst place you ever worked? <laughs> ever happened to you? Or maybe they transferred you from one base to another base, and you thought to yourself, well, I'm going from Belvoir to Fort Campbell, and this is going to be awesome, or I'm going from here to Fort Bragg, awesome. And then the, your commanding officer turns out to, you're like, I just got out of West Point, and this is the worst officer I could ever work for. Ever happen? I know it has because you've told me. <laughs> so don't sit there and go, what? Uh, he's not talking to me. No. And you got totally nailed, right? You're in the trap and you're thinking, Lord God, why, why did I go through all that at West Point to get this kind of guy as an officer? I don't even want to finish. Uh, no, uh, no. And God says, no, if, you get, if you, something happens and a storm hits you, realize I'm going to deliver you. Just hang on. And this whole concept of he'll deliver you from the perilous pestilence. Wow, is that timely? So is God telling you, if you walk with me and run to me first, COVID shall not touch you? What say you? Well, that's probably not practical, right? So he's probably not literally talking about the pestilence. What's he talking about? He, figurative way. Because sometimes in your family, the dysfunction of your family, there's pestilence there, right? Or your marriage. You met this guy on eHarmony, you got married, things look primo, and then all of a sudden, he's not what he said he was on eHarmony. Trust me. I'm speaking from facts of friends that I know. And all of a sudden, you're looking at this going, oh, it's pestilence, all right. Well, then what do you do? Well, God says, I'm, I'll be there to help you. Just run to me. Verse four, when you run to God, what does he do for you? What's he do? Covers you with his feathers. Does, okay, <laughs> does God have feathers? No. So this is zoomorphic language from, as a figure of speech. God, who is spirit, says, Think of me in this situation like, he said, you've already thought about me as a cave, you know, but think about me like a bird. If I was a bird, what would I do? I'd, I'd do that. You're the little chick and you come to God and you say, man, I cannot believe what's happening to me. The world's falling apart. I'm under attack. I, I don't think I'm going to be able to make it. And God says, you just come to me. And when you come to me, I'm going to be like a, well, like a, like a bird, like a mother, like a goose or whoever, and you can just hide under my wings. I'll protect you. Isn't that a tender picture? When you are like beaten, battered by the storm, and you come to Jesus, and you're like, man, what was I waiting for? He's like, I'll, I'll protect you. He says, I'll also um, use my truth, which I would say is the word of God. You know, you read the word of God, and it becomes like a, well, he says, it becomes like a shield, doesn't it? It becomes a shield to you. That's what he says. I'll be your shield and your buckler. Shield. So if you give a soldier a shield, you're saying as his commanding officer, you are going to face what potentially in your career? Conflict, right? No, I'm just going to set that in my office. It's going to look good for 30 years. Then I retire. No. <laughs> shield means you're going to get attacked, right? Remember Ephesians 6 where Paul says, you know, what's the devil do? Well, he fires arrows at you all the time trying to discourage you, you know, sideline you, destroy you. And you've you got to absorb those. Jesus, Jesus is telling us, you know, hey, here, trust me, I will be your shield. I will protect you as you're in battle. And the word for bulwark or, or a buckler has different translations in the Hebrew text. Uh, I think the best translation of that word etymologically is a, he's a wall. Imagine trying to attack this wall. Where is the point of entrance? Well, there's, I don't, I don't see the gate. And so this is like God. He says, if you run to me, I'll be your shield uh, from what's going on in your life. And I will also be like a wall to the enemy that's attacking you. Well, then why aren't you running to him? <laughs> that's the question. He says, you should be encouraged 
that I will be there for you. He does more stuff. Look at verse five. He says, you shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrows that fly in the day, nor the pestilence that walks in the darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall in this battle of life at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near to you. Only with your eyes, this is lux talionis, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Walk with me and I'll eventually show you, I will judge the wicked and you'll live to see it. He says, because you, why have, will this happen? Well, because you obediently made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you. No, it, no plague come near your dwelling. God says, when you, when you run to me, be confident I'll be there for you. Be encouraged because as you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, you shall not be alone. I shall be with you. That's what he's saying. Don't be afraid of the terror at night. When my sister Marla had a, term, a terminal ovarian cancer, three forms, statistically a total anomaly. And she was a health food fanatic. And she's like, how did this happen to me? I mean, she said, Marty, are you kidding me? Three forms of ovarian. But I remember as I flew out to Spokane to be with her multiple times before she died, uh, when, I, when I came back uh, the first time, before I was gonna go back uh, the last time, I was, I, it was, Liz was in California, I was at home, it was nighttime, it was dark, and I was, I was in, uh, death was impending. And in my room, is, is, is that, like the darkness in my room had a weight to it. And it was like crushing me in the bed of despair. And so I told the Lord, of all that I know about you, I cannot handle this despair. It's too heavy for my soul. Can you please remove the darkness of despair? Instantly, there was shalom. There was peace. Why? Because this is God. He says, if you run to me, I could have said, I'll just intellectually handle this. No, sometimes God whittles you down and says, no, you don't be afraid of the terror at night when the devil comes and whispers to you. Yeah, where's God in this? What kind of God do you serve? Is he a God of love, etc.? No, Jesus says, no, don't worry. I, you're not gonna be afraid of the, of the terror by night, arrows that are shot at you arbitrarily over the wall that can hit you. I mean, I didn't even see that coming, Lord. He said, hey, don't worry, don't worry. I will protect you, I will protect you. I think it is somewhat hyperbolic what he says here. He's overstating the fact, because we all know as you walk through life, well, sometimes things do happen to me. But he's telling you there, but I'm gonna be with you in it and bring protection to you that you, well, you haven't even seen coming. Remember the story of uh, Esther and, and Mordecai? Esther is a beautiful little story. And you've got Haman wanting to wipe out all the Jews. He builds gallows to hang all the, you know, get rid of his enemies, the Jews. Who ends up hanging on the gallows? Haman. It's that lex talionis, you reap what you sow. And God says here, if you walk closely with me and run to me when you're in times of despair, you will live to see my protection my protection. Well, what kind of protection? Um, well, notice what he says in verse 11. This is amazing. This is a whole sermon series, just verse 11. Well, he says, be, be confident and encouraged that he will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. In their hands, they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent shall you trample underfoot. He says, be confident, run to me. Number two, be encouraged because when you come to me, I'm gonna dispatch angels to assist you. Do you see them? No. What are you gonna be doing the first day in heaven? They're gonna be coming to you. Man, I remember back in 67. I was there for you, you didn't even know it. I remember in 82. I was there for you and you didn't even know it. Are you serious? Give me the details. He says, I'm gonna give my angels charge over you. So here's a question. How, do you think that you have a personal angel? You're so quiet now. Well, I don't know. It'd be cool if I did, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah you do. But, but you'd be wrong saying you had one because what did he just say? Angels, plural. He says, if you run to me, I'll give angels. Uh, they'll be in charge over you. Now, the old devil took, the devil knows the Bible. He quoted this to Jesus in the wilderness before his ministry began to discourage him. See, the devil takes the scriptures and twists it and so he takes the word of God. So whenever something comes to you and it's the Bible in your head, but you think to yourself, that contradicts what God has said elsewhere. Is that from the spirit or the devil? Well, it's not from the spirit. So Jesus rebukes the devil in, in Deuteronomy 6.16 and tells him you should not tempt the Lord your God. 
But when you, when you look at this text, he's telling you what was applicable to the Lord Jesus, because after the Lord Jesus dealt with the devil, it says in the book of uh, Matthew, verse 3, 11, that after he took on the devil in the wilderness and said this to him, uh, that's when the angels came and ministered to Jesus. You kind of wonder, did they bring him food? Did they bring him drink? But the angels, plural, came and ministered. So what he tells you here is when you run to God, he's going to be there to assist you and help you, and he will do it through angelic format. I, I'm real excited one day to meet Christ face to face. And the second thing I'm going to do is meet family members, I think. And then I want to go around because I got all eternity to run into the angels to say, could you guys like fill me in, fill me in. Uh, when Liz and I were heading to uh, Stockton uh, for our, to work at the church plant up in Northern California, leaving uh, Arizona, uh, where I was a youth pastor to go up, remember in the retirement community where I was a youth pastor, <laughs> my first job, uh, we're, we're leaving, and, and so we were in Tucson. Uh, there was no place, to, no fast food where we lived in Green Valley because it's a retirement community. Everything closed at six. So we drive to Tucson to get, go to Dairy Queen. So we were up there with the kids before we moved to California to plant a church. And uh, we were uh, on the freeway uh, heading down to Green Valley, just going south out of Tucson. Uh, and uh, Liz said, uh, one of the kids has got to go to the bathroom. That always happens, doesn't it? Are you kidding me? So, so I pulled off the freeway. It was a two-lane two exit. I pulled off, saw across the freeway. I had to hang a left, go over a bridge to get to a gas station over there. So I pulled off with a whole bunch of other cars, and I'm sitting at the light. And so I'm get, about ready to turn, and I can turn left or right. Uh, and Liz said, oh, there's a gas station right there. So the light was green, and as, as I'm going, she told me that. So I hit the brake, and as I hit the brake to look to my right, just to see if, the, how, if I could get over there, car, four guys in a car, all stone drunk, literally flew through the intersection and took the car out next to me. Had I not paused, I'd not be here. I'd be dead. I tend to think there must have been a cherubim or two kind of going, whoa, hit the brakes. See, because he says, oh, I will protect you if you run and you hide into me. I'll give you another illustration. When I was in California at my last church, uh, I, I went to the felon ward to, to do church services. That's the ward they gave me, the felons. I had the Crips, the Bloods, the Norteños. I had all the Hispanic gangs. I had all the, I had all the Vietnamese gangs, ruthless killers. I asked one kid one day, he wasn't even shaving yet, peach fudge on his face. I said, hey, you're 15 years old. Why are you in here? I'm in here for murder. Why did you shoot somebody? He goes, I was doing a drug deal. I had the drugs. Uh, and the guy asked me, you're going to be good for your end of the drugs? I guess so I shot him. Like, for what? He said, nobody asked me a question. He's 15. Those kind of guys. So the first time I went in there, big room, about 50 inmates. And so I went in there, and the guard said, you know, set up, you know, set up the chairs in, you know, in rows for church. I'm like, I don't want to do that. So the guards are off doing stuff. So I took all the chairs, and I put them in a giant circle. And then all the inmates come filing in. They're all sitting together, all the crypts, the bloods, all the gangs. They're all sitting all together. And so I walked into the middle of the circle to do my Bible study so I could walk and look at them in the face. Nobody had ever done that. And so I, I started the Bible study, and the guards came. And this one guard was about 6'8". And he comes running out of the guard booth. You need to stop, man. You need to stop what you're doing. I'm like, what, what, what did I do? He goes, you get, get, get out of there. I'm like, what? What's going on? And so he goes, you got to put these chairs in a row. I'm like, why? He goes, you cannot stand in the middle of 50 felons. If they seize you, we can't help you. And I said, no, I, I, I think I got this. I said, I wanna, this is how I want to do it. I want to talk to them in the face, walk around and talk to all the gangs. Uh, I did that for five years. They never touched me. And my mom even went there. She can tell you. Awesome place to minister. They didn't even touch my mom. Amazing. But I'd walk around to each one of those guys and I would talk to them. And then they would ask me, would you pray for me? I got a court date. You know, I pray for my mom. I'm in here for a drive-by and I'm not getting out. And my mom's really worried about me. Could you pray for me? You know, they never touched me. They respected me as a pastor and they knew I loved him and cared about him. And who was in the room with me? Well, guards. But who's behind the guards? Angels. I know they're there. So I'm, I'm, I'm confident in my God's protection, and I understand that when I run to him, I'm encouraged because I know he's there for me, and he'll be there for you. And lastly, he says, when you run to him, uh, verses 14 to 16, this is called the divine oracle. The, the first verses were wisdom sayings. This is a divine oracle. Where God in the, speaking to you, what does he tell you? What does he say? Verse 14. He's, he's going to tell you to be expectant for him to do these things when you run to him. 
because he, this is you, uh, has set his love upon me. Therefore, notice the cause effect. Because you love God and put him first and run to him. Therefore, I will deliver him. Uh, I will set him on high. That's your mountain fortress. Because he has known my name. He shall call upon me. Notice you have to do this. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. Translated, if I don't call on him, he ain't answering. Uh, I will answer him and I will be with him in trouble, not spare him from it, be with you in trouble. I will deliver him and I will honor you. And then what's he say at the end? With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. You want to live a long time? What does he say you should do? Man, you got to watch what you eat, man. I mean, no bread, you know, no steak, no meat. You know what I'm saying? Salads all the time. Are you kidding me? No, I eat whatever I want, and I still obey verse 16. You know, you could tell I eat whatever I want. And, and God says, I will, I will satisfy you. I will, I, will, I will extend your time. Isn't that amazing? Remember Hezekiah when his, God tells him you're going to die, and what's the king do? He falls down before the God, God and prays and begs for, Lord, be merciful to me, a godly man. And God looks down from heaven and says to Hezekiah, yeah, I'll give you some more time. I'll give you, I had decreed you were going to die on such and such a day, but I'm going to give you more time. He says, if you run to him and you find him as your place of, uh, well, provision and protection, uh, he's going to do all those things he just said for you. I would submit to you, if you've never memorized the passages of, of scripture, this would be a great place to start because you are going to face a storm or two. Let's pray. God, thank you for who you are. Forgive us when we run for you, from, from you or we get angry in the storm shake our fists at you, ask all kinds of provocative questions when we should be moving toward the place of safety where you will provide protection for us. Help us to do that and to do it to your glory and have many stories to tell our children in Christ's name. Amen.